great, great pleasure to be able to keep this tradition of the interim program going where for 20 or 25 years uh, we have been inviting people up to share how Judaism has influenced their lives and every year we hear things like I never knew and I went through the same thing or what a story and uh, I'm been grateful to Marvin for being able to emcee this, to keep this all together, to keep it flowing, and to keep it timely most of all, right on time. Uh, so in order to help him with that, I'm going to stop uh, talking, and I, I can't wait to hear all of the stories. Thank you, Marvin. Shana Tava, everyone, and welcome to the 2022. Yom Kippur Interim Service. I'm going to take a moment, Rabbi Baisley, I want to thank you for once again giving me the honor and the privilege of being able to moderate this program. I thank you so very much. Our first speaker this morning will be Seth Leibowitz. Seth grew up in Pleasantville, New York, graduated from Mercy College in 1984 with a degree in special education and behavioral science. Seth married in 1986 to Laura Dreyfus, now Laura Leibowitz. He has been working for the state of New Jersey's Department of Human Services for close to 25 years and is looking forward to his retirement next summer. Seth, I got you, because my last name is the end of this month. I retired at the end of this month. I might take that one. There you go. We, they have three adult children, Emma Taylor and Jonah, one granddaughter, Pearl Jane. I give you Seth Leibowitz. Happy New Year. So, I grew up in a small town in Westchester, New York, Puzzle, New York, and there were very few Jews where I grew up. In fact, I was one of only five or six Jews in my class with less than 100 students. When I was a younger, with a name like Seth Leibowitz, it was pretty hard to not be identified as a Jew. My others, but my, my, but my, my family were basically high holy, high holy Jews. We never celebrated Shabbat or went to temple other than Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. I was bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah in, fact, <laughs> in fact, my mother already booked the venue before I even had a date for my bar mitzvah, and that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I had absolutely no close Jewish friends in my hometown. My closest buddies were all Italian and Irish. And I think the only reason I was never targeted for anti-Semitism was because my father was a town podiatrist, and he was really beloved in the town. And he would always tell me these stories about all these gangsters coming in and, and he working on these folks on their toes. And he said, Dad, this guy just beat up this kid over here, and so forth and so on. I am sure there were a lot of hidden anti-Semites, but I never really saw it. I did find out years later from a classmate of mine that his mom would never let me play with him because he was, I was a Jew. But my parents wanted me to explore my Judaism through Hebrew school and also at summer camp. So they sent me, me and my sister to Sedgwick Camps in Port Jervis, New York. There I was from a totally non-believing Jew to a Jew that had morning services every morning, wore kippah, couch and breakfast, Israeli dancing, Shabbat, Haftala. They were, they were all totally new to me. This was in the early 60s, not very far removed from the Holocaust. Every Saturday we would meet with these rabbis, and the topics would range from the Holocaust and anti-Semitism in America. These rabbis kept telling us these crazy stories of the Holocaust that's going to come to America, and that ovens had been found in the United States near in the, on the West Coast somewhere. And this always scared us. We were like 10 years old. We had no idea what this guy was talking about. And this scared us very much. And we also had the JDL come to camp, which also scared us even more. So there was a, a lot of scare tactics, tactics and brainwashing going on, and all this was a big influence on my life. I knew all the prayers before and after the meals. We always had to wear a kippah. Each bunk, each bunk had to arrange the morning prayers, for the morning services. This was totally out of my comfort zone. Remember, I'm a kid from Puzzle, New York, with all these Irish and Italian friends. I was a naive kid from New York who really knew nothing. There was, no, there was also the Soviet Jewry times, and I was amazed at how many kids my age were so militant and were strong believers in, this, in their Jewish identity. Away from camp, when I got back home, it took me some time to reconnect to my faith. I had quit Hebrew school 
after my bar mitzvah, and they decided, decided to go back for one more year, and was confirmed. My home rabbi was actually Chaim Stern, who you might know. He was one of the authors of uh, Days of Prayer. Uh, he both bar mitzvahed me and confirmed me. I believe I was, I, w I believe I was probably the first visibly tattooed Jew here in Anshem, <laughs> which we'd see. Uh, it's funny, enough uh, funny story. I walked into a tattoo parlor, my first, to get my first tattoo. I asked for a Jewish star, and this, this huge guy said, what, I want a Jewish star? So he, he said, here, here you go. So that was almost 40 years ago. And now I have about 30 more. Um, my, um, that was quite an experience 30 years ago, walking to a tattoo parlor, explaining to the heavy tattoo artist uh, that I ex wanted a tattoo on me. I often reflect back on the, sto on the stories from camp, and I feel very connected in a spiritual way to those who lost their lives. I, think, I felt compelled to get Jewish tattoos, and along with the Jewish star, I also have the Shema and part of the Mourner's Cottage tattooed on my arm. Um, I, believe, I believe I'm reincarnated from the Holocaust. I don't know, I have these dreams a lot. But that's another story also. <laughs> Throughout my life, I have had continued to have vivid dreams of personally being in the Holocaust. It is a constant thought and focus for me. I have read an extensive list of Holocaust fiction and nonfiction and continue to do so. Those rabbis at Sedgwick camps had held a job on me. <laughs> After Laura and I were married and had children, we raised them in, Jew in a Jewish household and celebrated not only the high holy days and many of the festivals as well as Shabbat. Our children have all graduated from Hebrew High School and, and, and has many Jewish friends to temple and, and religious school. Being Jewish to me is much more than being religious. It's being, it's a part of my being. I have been an usher at the temple for many years. I started out as a high holy day usher, and now I feel connected through Friday nights and our B'nai mitzvahs on Shabbat morning. Now with all my children, bar and bat mitzvah, and God will be my granddaughter and grandchildren to follow, the connection to Judaism has evolved and strengthened past my upbringing. Uh, this is a quote I might get tattooed on my arm. Uh, my father was a Jew, my mother was a Jew, and I am a Jew. And I think my parents would be very, very pleased that I have embraced Judaism to this extent and that I was able to go to Israel, which they never had a chance to do. All these experiences have influenced me and have brought me to this point in my life with Jewish children, my first Jewish grandchild, and my daily faith. Thank you so much. I did forget to say one thing. Um, if there is time, we'll love to take some questions and answers after, but I want to give everyone a chance to speak first. Uh, our next speaker, Jane Miller. Jane Hindez Miller is a third generation Temple member. She is vice president of special programs at Gombo Health, a leading health and wellness patient engagement company. Jane lives in North Brunswick with her husband, Steve Miller. Professor in the Department of Judaism and Rutgers Journalism. <laughs> that may be true. Uh, a professor in the Department of Journalism at Rutgers University. They have two grown daughters. Jane. Before I start, I would like to thank Rabbi Baisley for asking me to participate in this session. I've attended these for many, many years, and I'm honored to be selected to speak. When Rabbi Baisley asked me to speak about how Judaism influenced my life, I struggled a bit, because Judaism has always been a part of my life, my cultural identity. It's difficult to make the separation of how it influenced me. But as I went through the process of writing this reflection, what kept coming up was the impact that this building, this community, has had on who I am as a person and as a Jew. As all of my memories and recollections came back to me, I was struck by how interwoven my blood and the Temple family have been. I can't speak about one without the other, because the lessons I learned from my parents, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, cousins, and brothers were the same ones shared and reinforced within these walls. My mother's family, the Kleins, have been members of Aunt Yemeth for almost 100 years. We have pictures of my uncle, Martin Klein, who would have been in his 90s if he were alive, at his bar mitzvah in the sanctuary. Um, I don't know if you've seen the tablecloths that are embroidered with the names of temple members.
My grandmother, Flora Klein, embroidered the first set of those. My uncle, Steve Bennett, built some of the cabinetry that still sits in the building. And my Aunt Ruth Bennett was Ann Chamath's first female president. She's my aunt. <laughs> my mother's sister. Um, I remember as a child coming to religious school through the door that was off the landing on the front steps. Though it is now covered with bushes, I still have the urge to enter that way. The religious school sat where the media center is now. Our current religious school hasn't been built yet. I guess I'm really aging myself. Um, we started every day with one period of Hebrew and a period of Jewish history. Then the entire religious school would come together in the auditorium and Rabbi Spiro will, would tell Bible stories. We would all be enthralled because he was a great storyteller and would weave the tales that we could understand and enjoy. He would then lead us in songs like Zoom Golly Golly and everyone shared in the experience. I loved that time with Rabbi Spiro. When the new religious school was built, I think I was in second grade, the New Brunswick Home News came and took a picture and put it in the newspaper. They picked two girls and two boys to be in that picture, and I was one of them. I think it's the one and only time my picture has been in the paper. <laughs> I grew up in the Edgebrook section of New Brunswick with my parents, Sally and Nat Hindis, who were married in this temple, and my two older brothers, Paul and Bob. My grandparents lived on the corner of Rutgers Street and Livingston Avenue, seven blocks down from the temple, and most of my aunts, uncles, and cousins also lived locally. We had a Jewish home. My parents went to services off and on, but we always celebrated the holidays with my aunts, uncles, and cousins. There were so many members of my family at services that we filled an entire row. When the first service was over, my cousins and I would trek back to my grandmother's house. When it was time for the mid-afternoon service, we would come back here. We, we must have been quite a sight, our entire clan of cousins marching back and forth from our family's home to our spiritual home. I was not bat mitzvah. Back then it was optional for girls. However, I was very involved in youth group and I was president my senior year. I spent my weekends going to conclaves and ran the form carnival two years in a row. Youth group was really the highlight and center of my high school years. When I went to Hobart William Smith Colleges, a small college in upstate New York, I was not involved in Hillel, but I had a group of Jewish friends and we became very involved with the local temple. It was very small and I had a young dynamic rabbi, Josh Goldstein, and I attended services there and taught in the religious school. After college, I moved to Rochester, New York, and my involvement in Jewish activities began to wane. As I tried to make my way in the world, I wasn't interested in going to services, I didn't know anyone who was Jewish, and there was nothing for 20-somethings at that time in the late 70s. But the lessons I learned from my family continued to impact me, because Judaism isn't necessarily something I practice. It is who I am. I moved to Northern Virginia, and my roommate was a Southern Baptist from Mississippi. I introduced her to Judaism, New York, and life in the North, and she taught me about Southern Baptist, the Deep South, and Southern foods. She brought me to her hometown, Louisville, Mississippi. It was around 1980. It was an interesting and strange experience. I was the Yankee Jew. <laughs> Everybody in the small town knew who I was and wanted to see the Yankee Jew. <laughs> I think being a Yankee was worse than being a Jew, but it was a close call. <laughs> and by Yankee, I don't mean the Yankees too. <laughs> showed that wherever I am, whatever I am doing, my Jewishness is always a part of me and is always present in ways I may not be able to predict. I met my husband Steve on a blind date when I was attending the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania in 1982. While I had dated non-Jews, I never considered marrying one. Steve was Jewish and like me, not particularly religious. When we married in 1984, I never considered getting married anywhere but in this temple. This is where my parents had married, and I always knew this was where I would stand under the chuppah. It was a hot June day, and the sanctuary was not yet air conditioned. My uh, was not yet air conditioned since my aunt, the president, well, let's call her frugal, had refused to pay for it. <laughs> 
<laughs> my reception was the first event in the newly reconstructed Reitman Hall, which I don't know if it's still called Reitman Hall. Um, and best of all, it was air conditioned. <laughs> we lived outside of Boston for a few years and then moved back to this area, first to Edison and then to where we live now in North Brunswick. When we came back, there was never a question that we would rejoin the temple. I would not consider another option. When we had our daughters, Rachel and Karen, we sent them to daycare and then religious school here. As they grew, I loved joining anything that included parents as well as chaperoning their complex and other temple events. It gave me a feeling of completeness. But as they grew and their interests moved elsewhere to marching band and other activities, so did Steve's and mine. We became less active in the temple. However, we maintained a Jewish home. I filled our home with Jewish art, and every Jewish holiday was a main event filled with food, love, laughter, and family. Though I'm not in the physical building that often, Aunt Janet has remained central for me. When I'm not in these hallowed halls, oh, when I'm in these hallowed halls, I always feel a warmth, like I am with family, like I am home. I have always felt that way. The members of this community have always been members of my extended family. Whether it was time to rejoice, like when the day my daughters, Rachel and Karen, celebrated their benot mitzvah, or it was a time to mourn, such as when my father died this past June. This is where I be came because this is where I belong. This is where I find comfort and peace of mind. I often don't feel like I belong places, but I always feel like I belong here. I am happy to say that we gave Rachel and Karen a strong Jewish underpinning. Karen married someone she met on J-Date. A child of history, Karen insisted on being married in the synagogue, just as her grandparents and parents were before her. Rabbi Miller graciously agreed to officiate the ceremony with her fiancé's rabbi, thus enabling my son-in-law, Brian, to feel the same comfort that his bride and I feel in this place. Karen and Brian are active in a Reform synagogue in Marlboro and join Minion every Saturday via Zoom, along with their 20-month-old daughter. Like me, they feel comfort and peace in their congregational family and in Judaism. Rachel lives in Chicago and is more of a cultural Jew. However, she feels strongly that her moral values come from her Judaism and intends to keep it a part of her life. This year, she brought her non-Jewish boyfriend home for Passover. He helped us prepare the food and participated in the Seder. Rachel led us in songs, and it was a wonderful time. When I was young, my grandmother hosted holiday gatherings. As she aged, they were taken over by her children and then eventually by my cousins, siblings, and me. For some holiday, holidays like Passover, we split into nuclear families because it was just too much having 40, people, 40 family members at a Seder. However, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur break fast continue to be holidays when the entire family, all the cousins, second cousins, and pseudo cousins, would gather. Now I host the big family celebrations and holidays for the entire Hindus, Klein, Miller family and other holidays for my immediate family and my brother's families. I've become the matriarch of my family, ensuring family closeness and maintaining the Jewish light. It's funny how events like these change you and your life. I've become my mother, my grandmother, and all those who have come before me, making sure the family stays together and observes Judaism in a place filled with warmth, love, and care. With my father's passing, this is the first year that Steve and I are the only family members attending High Holy Day services at Angie Emmett. The women and men of my generation and their children have either moved away or moved on from observance. Though we may be the only ones here physically, I can still feel the presence of my grandparents and parents each time I walk into this building. Just as my father did after my mother died, I always go up to the memorial wall, touch their names on the plaques, and say hello to them. I visit them here because this is where they are and always wanted to be. Aunt Yamath has provided me with continuous Jewish connection through the ups and downs of my life. It has provided an anchor that has helped to strengthen the Jewish feelings inside of me so that I can share my spiritual self with family, friends, and friends outside of these walls. Our next speaker this afternoon, Phil Zambrana.
Bill lives in Yorktown, currently employed as a business manager at Sample, the company based in Piscataway, which is formerly the Rutgers Cell and DNA Repository. Phil and, <coughs> Phil and his wife have two daughters have been members of Anshanamu for over 16 years. Over the years, they have volunteered or participated in several Anshanamu events. These opportunities have allowed them to grow as a family and as individuals. The belief in giving back to the community was nurtured here at Anshanamu. Phil has been a longtime volunteer at the AEFT, the Anshanamu Men's Homeless Shelter Program, and volunteers as needed. Phil is a sitting a Milltown Council member, currently running for re-election, and has previously served on the Milltown Board of Ed for a term. He's active in several community committees like the Milltown Fourth of July Committee, the Ford Avenue Redevelopment Committee, and the Milltown Revitalization Committee. An unapologetic Mets fan. I knew that because I saw your eyes. I saw the look in your eyes. He said it was about being from the north, so we don't have to go there. Originally from Queens, New York, he loves sports, spending time with family and friends. I offer you Phil's and So, good afternoon to all of you. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Phil Zembrano, um, married to Andrea Schoen. Um, and I was asked by Rabbi Basel to talk a little bit, or speak a little bit about um, what Judaism means to me. But in order to do that, I kind of have to give a little bit of history. Um, I'm a Catholic by birth, you know, communion, baptized, uh, confirmation. I was an altar boy for two or three years. Um, but I'm a Jew by marriage. And, uh, which, guess, which I guess means that I'm a Jew by choice. So when my wife, Andrea, and I were discussing marriage when we were just dating, you know, you know kind of knew that was going to happen at some point. Um, she, I should say, well, it, it was a kind of a great discussion, but it was made very clear to me that, that if we had children, they would be Jewish. Uh, not only because, uh, obviously, my wife is Jewish, but also because she wanted them raised with Jewish values and, um, and practices. Uh, I was asked to convert. I politely declined because I didn't think I was a great Catholic. I didn't think I'd make a great show. <laughs> but at that time, I didn't really know um, what this was all about because my wife was actually not a practicing Jew at that time, uh, more of a cultural Jew at that time. Um, and, but I quickly learned what all that kind of entailed. Um, so I'll say that although no contracts or agreements were signed, uh, I agreed that it would be a great idea to uh, raise our children in Jewish faith. I thought to myself, piece of cake, this is going to be easy. <laughs> Little did I know. Um, we started our Jewish journey as a couple in Great Neck, Long Island, um, where our youngest attended a, a pre-K um, school class. And we periodically attended uh, Friday night services. Um, unfortunately, that temple experience uh, left a lot to be desired, and we were a little disappointed, to say the least. About a year and a half later, uh, we moved to Milltown, New Jersey, the center of Jewish life. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and our girls were enrolled in uh, Montgomery's religious school. So I was hesitant at first. Um, I didn't think that I kind of belonged here, so I, I didn't attend services um, at the beginning. Um, but as my oldest started on the bat mitzvah track, Andre did say it would really be good if you showed up a little bit more because it would, you know, just make it like it was great to be here. I'm like, oh, that's that's perfect. Whatever whatever our daughters need, that's what I'll do. Um, and that's where I began to spend more time here. And of course, for those who've gone through the bar bat mitzvah um, experience here, you know it's. It's like a, a Monday and a Wednesday, and then Monday and Wednesday and Friday, and then Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday. And then you're just here the whole week. <laughs> and, and since we live like literally 10 minutes down the road, you know, if, if, if folks needed something, or hey, would you like to volunteer? Like, yeah, I'll be right there. Or, hey, would you do this? Like, yeah, not a problem. So you really have to learn how to say no a little bit more. But, um, but it, was all, it was all good. It was all good. Um, and waiting in the media uh, center, waiting for my kids, or, or just doing, doing things in between, um, I started to meet people. Um, and this, to me, is what makes Aunt Shamit so special in a way. Um, 
there's always someone around, there's always someone that's trying to um, start a conversation, or say Shabbat Shalom, or give you a handshake, or a hug, and to me it all boils down to one thing, and one word, community. Um, and one of the special things about this community is that um, the education and the wealth of experiences that my daughter's actually experienced here. Uh, my girls were both on uh, the youth group, uh, they went on many uh, multiple enriching trips, um, that I'm sure they would not have or could have experienced anywhere else other than here. They both went through Hebrew High, uh, both went to Jewish summer camps, had great experiences. Uh, my oldest daughter spent a semester in Israel uh, at Heller High, which was formerly EIE. Um, that was kind of eye-opening. Uh, you know, the kid goes to Israel for four and a half months, and then she comes back and says she hates the United States. She hates New Jersey. She wants to go to New Jersey. Uh, she wants to go to Israel. It's like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> spent uh, a summer at, at Mitzvah Corps in, um, in New Brunswick, which were both uh, transformative experiences for them. Um, and it all is because of the connection to Judaism. So um, it's also through our experiences here uh, that we were able to give back in, in whatever way we could. Um, and that sparked our commitment to continue to do so. Volunteering at events like the Community Passover or cooking and cleaning up at various dinner events, or spending a night at the temple during homeless shelter coverage, participating in committees that make a difference. It's all part of my Jewish experience. Um, because of how I've always felt connected here, uh, I, it actually gave me a little bit of, um, I don't want to say confidence, but I, uh, it gave me a little bit of a, a kick to decide to uh, run for local office. First, the Board of Ed in Milltown, and then uh, as a councilman in Milltown. So, if you haven't already guessed, my, my whole being is about community here uh, and the experience of the community. Um, sharing with the people in this community, uh, learning about their lives, their experiences, where they came from, what they've done, um, has been very important to uh, both Anya and myself and our children. Uh, we share, uh, as a community, uh, religious events, lectures, concerts. Um, and most important, we share the joyous moments and the sad moments as well. Um, one of the fondest memories I have is how many people and how many days in a row they continued to come to our house in Milltown when my father passed away for his shiva service. Um, we support one another through the good, the bad, uh, and the sad stuff, uh, and that's how Judaism has influenced me personally. Um, I feel fortunate to, be, to have been accepted here uh, and been able to participate and contribute. I can personally say that if any of you folks ever needed anything from me, just say the word and I'll be there. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank my wife, Andrea, for finding Aunt Shanna. But Andrea, since it was my idea to move to New Jersey in the first place, <laughs> thank you very much. Our last speaker this afternoon, uh, Andrea <clears throat> Lynn. Born in British Columbia, Canada, she emigrated to America on a work visa, ended up meeting a nice Jewish boy and stayed. <laughs> Along the way, she received a graduate degree as a family nurse practitioner from the College of New Jersey in order to help fellow immigrants and medically underserved access health care services. Prior to becoming a nurse practitioner, she was an inpatient and community services nurse for 20 years. Other jobs included summer camp counselor and nurse and backcountry wilderness trip leader. Her passions include being a mother to her three children, Jacob, Juliet, and Henry, traveling with her family, and sharing life's ups and downs with her husband, Kevin. She aspires one day to have time to play her guitar and violin, road trip in an RV, and read a novel for fun. She credits her success to grit, hard work, a fantastic sense of humor, the love and support of her family, and a whole lot of the share. Our next speaker, Andrea Lynn. Well, I'm profoundly honored to be asked to speak this holiday. My name is Andrea, and I am a congregant, a mother of three children, a wife to Kevin, and a convert. I didn't have to convert. I chose it. And had I refused, I know I would have still been loved and accepted. But there is a story, and it's a good one. 
and it begs the question, who is a true Jew? Recently, I was able to spend significant time back home in Nova Scotia and was given time to reflect on my journey to Judaism and its impact on my life. As I drove through the places I had walked before, like the Annapolis Valley and the rock-swept beaches of the South Shore, I was reminded of the girl I used to be, the frightened young girl trying to make it in a world without a safety net of any kind, no lifeboat, no buoy, so to speak. I was raised in Nova Scotia, a small province in eastern Canada. I received very little religious schooling. My parents' experiences with strict organized religion during the 1960s formed their decision making. The old ways were going out by that time, and parts of Canada were in social chaos, as was happening here in America. Nova Scotia exists by the rhythm of the seasons, as does Jewish life. However, my parents decided I would choose my own religion, but gave me no frame of reference from which to start. <clears throat> a sort of godless existence. And parents do the best they can with the skills they have, but their choice was beyond the emotional capability of a child, and by doing so, absolved themselves of marital conflict. So I grew up like one of those characters in the wind at a car dealership, kind of flapping about without direction except for the people I will introduce you to in this story. Broken hearts, alcoholism, the failure of two marriages meant that my parents couldn't really get out of their own way, and my brother and I were the unfortunate witnesses to it all. Meanwhile, surrounded in a world of French, British, and Gaelic culture, I had no idea I was destined to fall into Judaism. Hillel described my struggle very clearly many centuries ago when he stated, in a place where no one behaves like a human, you must strive to be human. I met my husband Kevin when I was 19 years old at a summer camp in Maine. It was not love at first sight. <laughs> but I will get to that later. <laughs> at the time, the summer camp had Friday night candles on the schedule, as it was called, and I went to go see what it was all about. And all of a sudden, a light went on in the world. Point A connected to point B. Blessing over the bread, Chad. Breaking the bread, Chad. Blessing over the wine. I immediately realized the basic blessings were the same in both religions. There was a core belief, a core of love and understanding. As my granny Barb once said, same department store, and that's how I started attending Friday Night Candles at camp. And the longer I hung around Jewish people and made Jewish friends, I realized a few key truths. One, the world outside Nova Scotia was huge and diverse and beautiful. Everything didn't have to hurt. Two, Jewish people lived by the rhythm of the seasons and desired to do good inherently, like Nova Scotians. After I graduated from university, I left home for two years to work as a registered nurse, first at Dartmouth College Hospital in New Hampshire. Kevin and I continued our friendship as I traveled all over the United States, choosing to remain in New Orleans the most at Tulane Medical Center. During that time, Kevin and I talked over the phone a lot. We talked about the things friends talk about in their 20s, but also how I had been fascinated with Judaism and how the Christianity I knew sprang from that. I read a lot of books, spent as much time learning about other cultures, popping into music stores in the French Quarter on my off time, driving around my little Oldsmobile Alero. I stuck out like a sore thumb in the deep south with my Nova Scotia license plates. I listened to my patients of color. I sat in Martin Luther King's church and felt the ruts in the pews. I asked more and more questions. I read more books. On my off time, I sometimes flew to New Jersey to see my friend, Kevin. <laughs> when it came time to renew my assignment, he said, you know, why don't you come do an assignment in New Jersey? So I did. And that's how Kevin saved me from Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> As I lived and worked just on Canal Street, and perhaps that was the shared 
Our relationship progressed, and one evening we were sitting down eating together, and he just looks at me and he goes, you know, Andrea, I can't marry with anyone who's not Jewish. Are you okay with that? And please understand, I have had many sit-downs with loved ones where chaotic bad news was coming my way to shake up my world like a magic eight ball. This wasn't even a weird thing for me to say. Because I had heard so much stranger stuff that I was expected to understand. And once I knew we were the ones for each other, and this was it, which was utterly terrifying and beautiful at the same time, as life tends to be, Judaism got, well, shall we say, sticky. To understand this story, you also need to know how much I respect the needs of Kevin's family. Kevin is the grandson of Holocaust survivors, Edith and Henry Lewin, who escaped Europe as teenagers and met in Bolivia. Kevin was raised as a conservative Jew. You also need to know that Kevin's brother made Aliyah and now lives in an ultra-Orthodox community in Israel with his wife and children. It's important to know that I have grown to love the central core of Judaism. Nova Scotians, old ones, who had shown me such kindness and buffered the abandonment I had endured were like that. They valued education and family, making things right when things were wrong, making soup and meals to bring to the sick and struggling, a world centered on home, family. My granny Barb used to say, the family that prays together stays together. And that's what she wanted for me, to find a congregation and a community I love my second family deeply. The studying for conversion itself was not hard. I had already been a student of the greater world. I practiced tikkun olam in my daily life and nursing practice. The conservative rabbi who supervised my conversion was originally from Canada, so he understood the culture I was coming from and helped bridge the gap. He helped me separate what was truly Jewish from what was culture. He taught me that it was okay to make Shabbat dinner with pizza. And you don't have to learn to make your filter fish. That's not the Torah. <laughs> the questions I had to answer at conversion were fierce. Do you accept the fact that you will be part of a people who are persecuted? Why are you choosing that for yourself? Will you promise to remove your tattoos? They insisted I learned to speak Jewishly. For example, the Old Testament is now the Torah. Don't get that wrong now, they said, with wagging fingers. Maimonides writes, there are 13 articles of faith for every Jewish person. This is what I based my entry into Judaism on. If Rambam taught that these pillars are central to being a Jewish person, I can do this. Although I've since learned that every text in Judaism is open to interpretation. <laughs> Coming into this faith from another, I can safely say Judaism has only deepened my understanding of the early Christian text and why Jesus was a controversial figure. Like adolescence, metamorphosis takes time and is often painful. I found that blind adherence to rules is in both Christian thinking and Jewish thinking. That is what drove my parents from religion of any kind. My father used to say, how can anyone act one way in the pew and be so hateful behind closed doors? It took me some time to get here to Anshe Emmet, where Kevin and I feel comfortable. I'll explain what happened next. That almost caused me to lose my way. When I was eight weeks pregnant with my first child, we took a trip to Israel. I was so excited. I had saved up all my vacation time from the hospital was really looking forward to see all the place I had read and heard about. I was interested in walking in the footsteps of history to see the Israel I had read about in the Good News Bible as a child and the Torah as an adult. The good Jerusalem that my dying patients of all faiths dreamed of returning to at the end. But the trip broke my heart. It was the last straw. The feeling that no matter how hard I tried, all that I had sacrificed to leave my country and my people to build a cohesive, healthy family, I would never be good enough to be accepted. First of all, I met Jews who crossed the street when <coughs> Kevin and I approached, despite being dressed modestly. I found unkind stares. I also found other Jews directly blocking my access to the women's side of the Western Wall. 
And all this time, I just wanted to touch the wall and talk to God. And I had done everything right, for goodness sake. But it, it didn't happen that way. My trip was really difficult. I felt even more culture shock than I was already experiencing trying to adjust to America in general. And I left silently crushed. After my son was born, a difficult pregnancy and preterm labor, I held it together for about nine months before slipping into a deep postpartum depression. Not only was I not even a good enough Jew to be accepted, I was destined to be an awful parent. I could not bring myself to be in the conservative temple because obviously this conversion was a completely meaningless piece of paper. I was a Jew on paper only. And when I was asked if I would accept persecution by the Council of Rabbis, I didn't realize it meant from Jews to other Jews. It took me many, many years to recover, to trust that this was not a colossal waste of a promise. It was a promise to Kevin's grandparents that their survival was not in vain. They would have Jewish descendants. It was a promise I made to my own grandmother disagreed with my parents' decisions and secretly raised me to be the mother I am. Through her visits and phone calls and insisting and supporting my conversion to Judaism in order to build the healthiest family I could. And my granny Barb was a lifelong member of the Church of England. And I was told that she would be upset if I converted, but no. In fact, she was not at all upset. She encouraged me to throw myself headfirst into a beautiful it was hard to return to Judaism when there is a faction of Judaism that doesn't believe you are enough of a Jew and will throw stones at you. It doesn't seem right, and it's not at all what I studied and discussed during conversion. The Judaism I knew was kind and fair. The Judaism I knew would not deliberately hurt my mother-in-law by her sons fighting over if my brother-in-law could attend our wedding. The Judaism I knew wouldn't teach his children to see others as not real Jews. As Kevin and I built our family, we both struggled to find a Jewish home. I think my experience also shook him as well. What sort of religion would make him feel compelled to say to me, be Jewish or we can't marry? Seeing my devastation, how I fell apart into a million pieces, we both treaded carefully on finding a new temple. Through therapy and time, I began to rebuild myself. I have written the rabbi many letters, a conservative rabbi, to explain my decision and have never mailed them. Over the next few years, we attended a few temples informally, none feeling right, and we entered a difficult period in our marriage. We were adrift without a rudder, and it was not what Granny had in mind for me, and she knew it. In 2016, my mentor, my best friend, My granny Barb decided to enact her right to die, to pass away peacefully in Canada. My granny was brilliant and proper and funny all at the same time. My uncle, my mother, and I flew to the hospital and spent an evening with her in the hospital, laughing and joking. The procedure, she called it, would be in the morning. Granny's lungs were so bad, it took her 25 minutes to walk to the bathroom. I walked with her to the bathroom as her nurse. Between her feeble breaths, she asked me if everything was okay in my life and if Kevin and I were okay. And I 100% lied to her. I wanted her to feel as if she was leaving me solidly on two feet, as she has always done, calling me on the phone. How are you, my girl? Which college have you chosen? Nursing? No, that's not right. You belong in medicine. Andrea, you must not talk with that dreadful Nova Scotia accent. <laughs> Granny left this world in peace and left me in a place where I could not speak directly to her. I left the shell of her at St. John Regional, Regional Hospital and had to return to New Jersey. When you have lost your mentor and best friend, who was so proud of the person you became, it changes you. I stepped back from hospital nursing and took courses to be a nurse practitioner. I took a school nursing job and was randomly placed in, of all places, 
an orthodox yeshiva. <laughs> <laughs> number two. It was there in an orthodox yeshiva that I began to heal because I met kind, loving, modern orthodox Jewish women who taught me there were many ways to be observant. They respected my choices and my journey. And I shared my story after a while and they were horrified that Jews would do that to other Jews and helped me learn that it's actually more wrong to make a person feel ashamed for breaking a rule. I was not the problem at all. The ladies of the law were the problem. Those teachers at the school healed my heart and made me brave enough to try just one more temple. And that's when we walked into Anshe Emeth that Kevin remembered so fondly from teaching Hebrew school under Rabbi Miller. And it took us about five minutes to realize we were home. We could feel it. We fell in love with math class. Our first son, Jacob, was just bar mitzvahed in February, and our daughter is counting down the days until thirds. Jacob just returned from Camp Harlem, where he emerged anew. And despite all that we have been through, our family has a vibrant, healthy Jewish life that works for us, which is all I ever wanted. And this begs the question, what do Jews have to believe to be considered Jews? Are you still Jewish if you don't attend synagogue regularly? What if you accidentally drink prior to the blessing or marry someone who is Christian? What if you are cruel to another person but are steadfastly kosher? <laughs> Does the kashrut outweigh the cruelty towards another person? These are questions we continue to debate and discuss in that class where we might stay permanently. <laughs> so this holiday, I would ask of you, welcome the stranger with open arms, because there are many ways to be observant. If you encounter someone who is stuck on, we've always done it this way, maybe ask them to consider how much Jews have changed since temple times. To me, there should be no side-eyed glances or terse words here at Ansha Ameth. It just doesn't belong. Number two, consider what you are asking a person to do when you are trying to make them someone they aren't. Consider fellow Nova Scotian Elliot Page, who was forced to wear dresses to all premieres of his movie, Juno. Accepting people who they are in their authentic form without forcing them into a certain category is suicide prevention, and to me, pakuach nefesh, to save a life. To me, this is inherently a Jewish value. Accept people as they are, as God made them. Number three, be a granny barb. If there is one thing I know for sure, is that since coming to Anja Ameth, I have started to talk to granny whenever I need. I look up at the stars in the, in the wallpaper of the sanctuary. I feel her love and her hand on my shoulder. Be a consistent presence in a child's life. Show up for them, for the events in their lives. Follow up with phone calls. Ask them how they are doing. When tough things happen to children, the antidote is the presence of a consistent, caring adult in their lives. In fact, it's medicine, as it can last for years to come. This is living tikkun olam on a small scale, repairing the world. Number four, be a Henry Lewin, Holocaust survivor and Kevin's grandfather, who is the namesake of our last child, Henry, who stood up to hatred, to shaming of a different kind of Jew by stating, after all we've been through, who are we to tell Kevin who to love? And there it is, the story of my journey to Anshe Emeth and Judaism has brought me, as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, the ultimate time management plan. My new Jewish life has taught me to separate what seems urgent from what is truly important. Family, relationship with God, and community. And thank you, Anshe Emeth community, for just being you. You're everything that I needed, and everything I didn't know was even possible. Thank you.
wonderful presentations. You, you all get first dibs at great pass later. <laughs> I, I want to quickly thank uh, Jonathan Moran for recording all of this so we can throw it up at some point on YouTube for those that couldn't be here in person. So make sure you like, subscribe our YouTube channel and share it. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We will be beginning afternoon services at 3.30, and I give Marvin complete authority to cut this off whenever necessary. Marvin, thank you again. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.